Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Man, it has been a long time since I last uploaded here on YouTube. It's been more than a year. I will make a separate video sort of explaining what I've been up to these last 18 months or so. Uh, but before I do that, I did want to get this video out of the way, get this video pumped out for you guys, because this is a very, very, very special uh, release that has just shipped. Yes, this is the long-awaited, highly anticipated Lionel Vision Line Norfolk and Western Class A 2664. And as you can see, I got the famous number 1218 right here. And I am going to be doing a full review of this engine and running session. So let's just go ahead and get right into it and just take a look at the just absolutely amazing details and features that this this amazing model has uh, to offer so let's go ahead and get right to it now before we go ahead and take a look at the actual model that you see before you let's go ahead and go into a little bit of a brief history on the real class a's the norfolk and western class a's were a series of 43 2664 articulated steam locomotives that were built by the nnw's own shops in roanoke virginia between 1936 and 1950. Number 1218, which is the engine that you see before you, was the 19th locomotive of the class to be built, and it was built in 1943. Now, to some out there who may not be as knowledgeable with railroad terminology, uh, basically, whenever you hear people like me uh, throwing out numbers, such as, in this case, 2664 articulated, what that means is uh, we are referring to the wheel arrangement of the locomotive. In this case, with the Class A, it has a 2664 wheel arrangement. That means that you have two wheels on the lead truck underneath the pilot, six driving wheels here, six more driving wheels here, and then four wheels under the, uh, on the trailing truck underneath the cab and firebox. An articulator refers to the fact that the front set of driving wheels right here could turn independently from the rest of the locomotive, and the reason that they did that was so that the locomotive could operate in, you know, they could build larger and more powerful locomotives to operate through steeper terrain where the curves are sharper and more winding. And so as a result, because of the fact that the locomotives were articulated, they could negotiate those tighter turns on those lines. Built with the intention of being a fast, heavy freight hauler, the NNW, while during testing, found that these locomotives put up some very impressive numbers. Operating at 25 miles per hour on a 0.5% grade, they found that these locomotives were capable of hauling trains uh, in excess of 4,000 tons, I believe around 4,800 tons. And then on level track at 64 miles per hour could pull trains in excess of 7,000 tons. These locomotives were also among the largest locomotives to ever operate on the Norfolk and Western. They measured it at about 122 feet long from coupler to coupler, measured about 16 feet high, uh, and weighed just under a million pounds. In terms of some of the actual performance figures that these locomotives uh, put out, uh, they produced over 5,000 horsepower, 114,000 pounds of tractive effort, and could operate at a top speed of about 70 miles per hour. Unfortunately, as impressive as these locomotives were, and they were very, very impressive locomotives, they were among the workhorse steam locomotives of the NNW's freight operations, uh, the Class A's could not compete with the cheaper maintenance costs and more efficient operations that diesel power had to operate. And by the late 1950s, the NNW began to retire these locomotives from revenue service. Number 1218, which is the locomotive that you see here, was retired in 1959. As many people who are familiar with the story of number 1218 will note, however, in 1987, after changing hands throughout the years various times, the Norfolk Southern, the successor to the Norfolk and Western, got their hands on the locomotive and restored her to operating condition as an excursion star and operated as a part of the NS's steam program alongside locomotives such as former Norfolk and Western Class J484 number 611. However, in 1991, uh, after the 1991 excursion season, uh, the locomotive was taken into the shops where she was restored in Irondale, Alabama, where she was to undergo a rebuild, and they were intending to have her placed back into excursion service by 1996. However, 
During the rebuild, the Norfolk Southern ended their steam program in large part due to public safety concerns after a, uh, an accident which involved the damaging of nine passenger cars uh, took place, as well as rising costs of maintenance for the locomotives. Because she was undergoing a rebuild at the time of the cancellation of the steam program, she was cosmetically rebuilt and put back together and was donated to the museum that uh, she currently sits in today. And that would be, of course, the Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia. She still sits there today, just blocks away from where she was first built in 1943. This model of number 1218 that you see before you was offered by Lionel in their 2022 Volume 1 Big Book Catalog. This is a part of Lionel's Vision Line series of products, which is the very top of the line, very high end, most technologically advanced models that Lionel have to offer. I believe that Lionel first introduced the Vision Line in 2009 with the release of their Vision Line 21010 2 Malays uh, for the Santa Fe. And of course, uh, Lionel offered several different road numbers uh, for this locomotive. They didn't just offer number 1218. They offered a bunch of different road numbers for this engine. And what's interesting is that, and probably what's uh, very cool in my opinion, is that um, they did a lot of variations with the different road numbers that they offered. Some of them have different driving gear. Some of them have blackened driving gear. Some of them don't. Some of them have uh, different pilots. Some of them have even different tenders. Some of them have the uh, the tender that was used on the Y3s, I believe. And of course, number 1218 is the only one that was finished in this gloss, uh, this glossy sort of scheme that you see. And uh, obviously with the, and I think even there was a, yeah, there was an unpainted pilot, like an unpainted version. There was an unlettered version. Uh, there was a fantasy version that had a red stripe along the tender, similar to that of the J's. And I think there was even a deal exclusive model from Mr. Muffin's Trains, uh, which was a Pennsylvania version of this locomotive. So it was effectively an O-scale model of K&L Trains' Pennsylvania FG1. Hopefully y'all get the reference there. Uh, but yeah, no shortage of variation for the different models that Lionel offered this engine. Uh, I mean, for the different uh, road names that Lionel offered this engine in, I should say. Now then, let's go ahead and take a closer look at all the different details uh, that this engine has to offer. And oh boy, there are a lot. We'll start off by taking a look at the different accessories that were included in the box with this engine. First and foremost, we'll start with the most obvious, and that of course is the instruction manual. And I highly recommend you read through this, particularly if you are new to Lionel, because it is very important. It shows you all the different steps that you uh, need in order to set this engine up on your layout and get it ready to run. Definitely recommend reading that. You got this little thing right here. It's a little smoke dispenser in case you want to dispense some or uh, add some smoke fluid. You would put it into your bottle of smoke fluid. You squeeze this little thing at the top. It sucks up some smoke fluid and you drop it into the smoke hole. Uh, you got this key, this little wrench right here. And this is to take off the uh, driving gear so that you can replace the traction tires on the driving wheels. And speaking of which, in this little package right here, uh, you got a uh, a set of extra traction tires, and also you got uh, an O-gauge dummy coupler in case you want to replace the O-scale coupler on the front of the locomotive for some double heading action. And lastly, you got this right here, and this is, I believe, a mounting pad in case you want to fit a KD coupler on the back of the tender. Say so you don't like the big O-gauge electro coupler that is, fed it, uh, that is fitted to the tender from the factory. Well, you just take that off, you screw this on. I believe there's little holes that are drilled into the back of the tender from the factory. And you can see there's some screws in there. You put this on and then you install a KD coupler and you're good to go in case you are really interested and want to make these things as realistic as possible. So we'll start things off by taking a look at the pilot. As you can see, it is very well detailed. You got some separately applied grab irons uh, as well as a separately fitted cup, or cup bar right here. This section of the cow catcher does swing out and there's a swing out scale front coupler. And as I said earlier, that can be replaced with a O gauge one in case you want to double head this engine with any other motive power you may have in your collection. You got a very nicely done front radiator grill right here, as well as some more separately fitted grab irons, as well as some safety tread on the uh, platform right there. And as you can see, there is a uh, an LED headlight. And what's really nice is that it is actually fitted with a little shade and that shade kind of gives off a sort of dual headlight effect which uh the real 1218 did have that sort of dual headlight design 
So what they've done is they fitted the headlight uh, lens with that little shade right there to give that sort of simulation. The backup light on the back of the tender is the same way. I'll show you that in a few minutes. On the smoke box front, on the smoke box door, uh, rather I should say, there is more separately fitted detail. Uh, you got this separately fitted badge right here that's got the engine number. Uh, you got this uh, separately fitted marker. Uh, I mean, these uh, separately fitted grab irons here, as well as two on each side of the smoke box front. And you got these two add-on marker lights. And this engine is fitted with the bicolor classification marker light feature. And I'll show you how that works here in just a minute. And as you can see, uh, there's lots of rivet detail all over the place. It looks very, very nice. Like I said just a second ago, this engine is fitted with the bicolor classification light feature. What that means is that the marker lights, or as Lionel calls them, classification lights, are programmed to shine in two different colors. They are programmed to shine, or uh, the little LEDs uh, can, uh, can light up, and you can choose between green and white. As you can see, I have them uh, on the white setting, but out of the box, they're on the green setting. And if you want to change the colors, the process is pretty simple. Uh, I will show you how to do it on the Legacy Remote, uh, but I do think you can also do it on the uh, the Cab 3 system that this engine, uh, I believe, is the first one to be officially uh, uh, fitted with the Cab 3 feature. So let me go ahead and show you how to change the classification light colors on the Legacy Remote. So all you need to do is just make sure you have your Legacy Remote, uh, like I do here. And then what you need to do is you need to press and hold down the AUX2 key, like this. And as you can see, the touchpad goes to a, sec a separate menu. You got these two soft keys right here. This one is for the, mark the classification lights on the tender. This engine does not have classification lights on the tender, however. And this one is for the classification lights on the locomotive. And then, as you can see, I just press and hold this, or just press this, the on key. And there you go, green. And then I press it again, white. Green, white. It is as easy as that. Going down the length of the rest of the smoke box, as you can see, there is a lot of separately fitted pipe work around the feed water heater, as well as quite a lot of rivet detail all over the place. You got some add-on grab irons right here and here. And of course, you got the main smokestack here. And of course, there is a smoke unit down, uh, fitted down underneath. And, if, and to um, load smoke fluid, obviously, you just take some smoke fluid and pour it just down the stack. On the sides of the smoke box, as you can see, there is more rivet detail down here, as well as the starts of the handrails that go down the length of the boiler. And then, as you can see, there is a separately fitted builder's plate right here, which is leg uh, legible under a magnifying glass. Moving down, as you can see, you got some more riveting that has been uh, cast into the sides of the steps here, uh, which lead up to the upper platform. Uh, the running boards do have safe, uh, drainage holes perforated into them, which is a nice touch. The side frames of the lead truck are uh, uh, very well detailed. You got the journal boxes uh, represented, as well as uh, some additional uh, details, some riveting down there. The cylinders are extremely well detailed. You got the separately fitted cylinder cock valve pipes on the bottom here, as well as uh, lots and lots of rivet detail on the uh, on the front here on the cylinder heads. You can see there is uh, what appears to be some uh, uh, separately fitted piping tucked in uh, underneath there, and then of course you got a separately applied uh, little badge right here that says A, and of course that means uh, the A stands for the class of locomotive that this is, which is of course a class A. And as you can see to top it all off, it is got a lot of rivet detail all over the place. And as you can see, that brings us now to the start of the wonderful running gear. This running gear looks amazing when in operation. We'll go ahead and take a closer look at that right now. As you can see the running gear, it is very crisp and very um, uh, Shiny, of course, it's supposed to be because this is not. This does not have the blackened rods. This does have the shiny silver rods. And as you can see, the running gear uh, looks really complex and busy. It looks great when it's in action. And of course, what's very nice is that the uh, the lubricating rods, which are these things right here that connect to this, uh, the crosshead, the main piston rod assembly right here, they do operate. They do move, and that is a very nice touch. And as you can see, the driving wheels—they got the nice spoke driving wheels with the counterweights on them. 
Moving up, as you can see, there is a lot of separately fitted pipe work uh, down here, as well as a very, uh, very highly detailed uh, air compressor right there. Moving a little further down, you got, just look at all of that pipe work. My, my, oh my, there is a lot of pipe work, and that is all, all of that is separately fitted right there, including this very nicely detailed reverse, um, this very highly detailed uh, reverse, uh, reverse rod or reverse gear right here. Uh, moving back towards the second set of driving wheels, you can see you got another really good looking set of driving rods right here. And just like on the front set, the lubricating rods do uh, move. The driving wheels again look great. They are spoked and of course you got the counterweights on them. Uh, and then moving even further back, you can see the uh, firebox uh, right here. This engine does come with the glowing firebox, which means that there is a little light in there and it flickers red or it glows red when the engine is turned on. And as the engine, as you run it faster and faster, the light gets brighter and brighter to simulate the fire burning hotter. You can see there's a ton of separately fitted pipe work right down here. It just looks absolutely incredible. Just amazing attention to detail from Lionel on this engine. Uh, and then as you can see the trailing truck, again, very well detailed, lots of uh, river detail, as well as uh, some uh, pipe work, I think that is right down there. And as you can see, the journal boxes look really nice. They're very well cast. And then finally, underneath the cab here, as you can see, there is a lot of separately fitted piping down here as well, including a very well detailed injector right here. And uh, overall, it just looks absolutely phenomenal. And of course, uh, you got some great river detail all over the place as well. Looks fantastic. Moving back up on top of the boiler here, you can see that we have now come across our first of two sand domes on this engine. And in case you're wondering, yes, the top of the sand dome on this engine does come off, as in the case with most newly tooled Lionel engines. It's a little hard to get off, but there we go. Uh, as you can see, it is held on by two magnets, and you got two switches here. You got the run program switch, and then you got this switch right here, which is marked BLE. That is the Bluetooth switch to turn on and off the Bluetooth system. And to... Uh, Fit, you can just uh, fit this back on, just like that. Or actually, maybe uh, the other way around. Looking at this, to the there we go. And then as you can see on both sides of the sand dome, you got these uh, separately fitted uh, grab irons down here. And moving a little bit further down, as you can see, you can, you're getting a really good view of the drainage holes on the running boards. But also you can see we have uh, come across the start of the throttle reach rod assembly that goes back towards the cab. And then a little bit further back behind the sand dome, you can see there's some more separately fitted pipe work, which also has some uh, rivet detail right here. And you can see there is a lot of cast in detail for the boiler jacketing, which looks really, really good. Moving back here, you can see we have come across the steam dome. And that also brings us to the whistle and the safety valves. This engine is fitted with the uh, pop-off safety valve uh, steam effect, which means that you can even see there are these two little smoke holes right here. Or, yeah, there's two of them. Uh, and underneath that, as well as for the whistle, they share the same smoke unit. Uh, there is a smoke unit down in there, and when you load smoke fluid in and you turn the smoke unit on and activate it, uh, steam shoots out of these holes to simulate the uh, pressure valves releasing uh, steam as on the real engines, these were used to relieve steam pressure inside the boiler. And like I just hinted earlier, this engine does have the smoking whistle, just as in the case with pretty much any high-end Lionel uh, steam locomotive, and increasingly any high-end steam locomotive, period, uh, these days. Uh, which means that there is a little smoke hole right here. And in fact, you actually load the smoke fluid into that smoke hole to supply a smoke unit for both of these. And uh, when you blow the whistle, a little plume of smoke shoots out to simulate the steam coming out from the whistle. And as you can see, the valves and the whistle are both very nicely hand painted. And I believe they are made of metal. And then moving back, we got our second sand dome. And just like with the first one that you saw just a minute ago, the top does come off. I forgot to mention both sand dome pieces do have these uh, cast in fill caps right here. And this of course is the switches to turn on and off all the smoke units. You got the main smoke unit, which is for the smokestack right here. You got the smoke unit for the whistle, and you got the smoke um, the smoke unit for the pop-off valves. And if you want to turn any of these on or off, you just go ahead and do that. They are located underneath the second sand dome. Sorry about that. Let me get this. There we go. 
And then finally, down here, you got some more add-on piping detail as well as some more cast and boiler jacketing, which looks really good. And as you can see, uh, separately fitted grab irons right here, as well as the continuation of both the reach rod and the handrails that go all the way back down to the cab. Moving further back towards the top half of the firebox, as you can see, there is a ton of separately fitted pipe work in front of the cab here. And as you can see, you got this separately fitted hand painted bell right here, which does swing freely. And you can see lots of pipe work down here. And there is a separately fitted dynamo generator right here. And for those who don't know, a dynamo generator is a small steam powered electrical generator, which takes a little bit of steam from the boiler and they run it through to provide electricity for the cab lights, the headlight, the bell, etc. Uh, and as you can see, just look at that pipe work down there. And then as you can see, just in front of the cab, you got the separately fitted grab irons here and here. And that brings us to the cab itself, which we'll take a look at next. The top of the cab has a lot of rivet detail, which is quite a nice sight to see. And then as you can see, the main feature on the top here is that these two roof vents do open and close, just like that. The size of the cab is also very nicely done. You can see you got some uh, hand-painted window uh, frame detail right here, and the windows do open and close. You can see one of the two separately fitted crew figures inside the cab here. And there's a lot of rivet detail once again on the side here. And you got a very crisp number 1218 painted right here. And as you can see, you got these, uh, these uh, add-on grab irons right here, which is quite nice. The back of the cab, as you can see, is very well detailed. The back head is fitted with lots of separately fitted and hand painted details, such as these uh, shutoff valves right here. You got a hand uh, separately applied throttle piece on the engineer side. Uh, you got some uh, hand painted uh, valves on the fireman side. And I think, yeah, you got some more valves on the engineer side. But of course, the main thing to be talked about on the back head is, of course, the firebox, which is um, you got the little holes perforated through the firebox doors. And you can see that there is a flickering LED back there to simulate the fire burning on the other side of those firebox doors. And there is a cab light up in the roof here, or right up, right, um, you can see right here. And that does turn off when the engine starts moving. And lastly, you can see that there is a lot of rivet detail back here, as well as these two separately fitted uh, pieces of uh, glazing. And then you can see there is a separately fitted deck plate right here, and it does have safety tread on it. And unlike most deck plates I've seen on steam engines uh, in O-Scale, uh, namely from places from people like MTH or even other Lionel engines, uh, this one does not sort of fold up and down. It just kind of sticks out like this. It's um, kind of in one position, and it just moves just a little bit, just to provide a little bit of space and clearance for the tender, uh, which is... Um, you know, I think, it's got a, I think it's a neat uh, feature in the sense that, you know, you don't have to worry about fiddling with it to... Uh, fold it up in order to connect the tender when you're uh, coupling the engine and the tender together. And you can see there's more rivet detail underneath the deck plate right there. And you can see there is the uh, first end, the uh, connecting end of the drawbar assembly. And I will talk more about that uh, right about now. So we now move from the back of the engine to the front of the tender. And as you can see, there is the receiving end of the drawbar. And what's notable is that you can see there's two little slots right here and uh, for two slightly different lengths in case you are uh, running this engine on maybe some tighter curves or you just want a more proto get prototypical gap. Not that it makes too much of a difference as you can see, but you got a closer coupling and a more distant coupling right here. Um, so you do have that option in case you want to couple your engine and tender just a little closer. And this drawbar is kinematic, which means that there is a little spring that this is connected to. And this drawbar is actually set into a little groove on the underside of the tender here. And that spring allows it to articulate when it's going around curves to allow for more gap, more clearance between the engine and the tender, allowing it to negotiate some of the tighter turns that other scales uh, would not allow or, you know, it wouldn't be possible with other scales. And in case you're wondering what I mean by it kind of articulates, well, take a look. You can see it does hinge out just a tad bit further when it goes over a curve. And that is a very nice touch. I love it when they add the kinematic draw bars under these engines. It allows you to get a much more close coupling between the engine and the tender and at the same time be able to use regular curves. Uh, although this, of course, is an 072 uh, recommended curve. Uh, that is the curve radius that Lionel recommends for this engine. And I haven't tested it on anything other than 072, so I don't know if that um, how sharp of a radius curve uh, curve that you could get away with, but I probably would play it safe, personally speaking. 
The front of the tender is very well detailed for an area that you're almost never going to see unless you unhook the engine from the tender. But as you can see, there is a lot of rivet detail and you even got some separately fitted piping up here and some print on the top here that says, be careful, black smoke is waste. You've just got so much detail. They did not need to go through the pain of putting all that detail on this uh, on this tender, given the fact that, um, or at least on this part of the tender, given that very few people are going to see it unless say, you, um, you uncouple the locomotive and the tender. And as you can see, the bay doors for the coal bunker are very well detailed with lots of latch detail and, of course, riveting, like I said earlier. And you can see the steps that lead up to the tender, to the, uh, uh, to the bay doors up here. And you got some separately fitted grab irons on both sides, which is a very, very nice touch indeed. Here's a quick look at the coal bunker. And as you can see, you got a real load of coal right here, and it looks great. The sides of the tender, as you can see, are very well detailed with rivets. There's a lot of rivet detail going on right here. And you can see there's a very crisp Norfolk and Western logo right here. The lettering looks absolutely perfect. The colors, the font, the distancing, it all looks pretty much spot on from what I can tell. So as you can see, don't really have any complaints here. And then you can see you've got some additional detail right here. I'm not sure what that is, but uh, this little circle thing right here. If, you can, if you're an expert on the class days and you know what that is, be, uh, feel free to leave a comment down below, but um, it still looks good. It's got some nice rivet detail right down there. The sides of the truck frames on the tender are very, very, very nicely detailed. You've got some pipe work right here. The journal box is once again, very nicely cast and tons of rivet detail all over the place. Moving back, you've got a lot of separately fitted brake rigging detail on the underside here, as well as some additional hand um, add-on uh, pipe work down here, I believe that is. Or, and then as you can see, there is a separately fitted toolbox right here on the uh, underside right here, with some latch detail, of course. Side frames on the back set of trucks here also look just as good as they did on the first set. Lots of pipe work, lots of uh, riveting detail. And the journal boxes, again, look very nicely cast. And then finally, moving to the back here, as you can see, you got some additional pipe work down here uh, for uh, where they would connect the hoses for the auxiliary water tenders that they often ran with these things. And then as you can see, you got some separately fitted step detail right here. And lastly, of course, you can see there is a Lionel electrocoupler right here. And like I said, if you don't like this, uh, you can take it off and there are uh, mounting pads included in the box in case you want to fit a scale KD coupler on the back. Up on top of the tender, as you can see, right behind the coal bunker, you got these little, uh, these really nice uh, sloped bits right here, which I always have loved on the tenders of the A's. I believe the Y6's also had this and I think even the J's had this sort of uh, design incorporated into their respective tenders. And I always thought I just added a bit of grace and a little bit of character to the line work on the uh, tenders. And then, of course, you got the signature doghouse right here, which was a little shelter for the brakemen to uh, huddle up in in the event that it was raining outside. Uh, so that's always nice. And as you can see, there is a crew figure fitted inside there, and there is an LED in there, uh, which does turn off, I believe, when the uh, engine starts moving. And then, of course, you got a lot of rivet detail all the way back down here, which looks fantastic. Behind the doghouse, as you can see, there is a uh, separately fitted water hatch right here, which does open up. There's nothing underneath, but it is nice that they have uh, gone through the trouble of making this a separately fitted part and giving you the ability to open and close it, just for that realism factor. And as you can see, even it has been very well detailed with lots of latches and riveting and even some separately fitted grab irons, it looks like. And of course, uh, just like the rest of the engine, there's tons of rivet detail, which is really nice to see. The back of the tender, as you can see, is also very well done. You can see you got some uh, more rivet detail, lots of rivet detail, in fact, all over the place. Several separately fitted grab irons, uh, including two on each side of the, uh, the steps here. And then as you can see, there is a backup light, which does turn on when the engine is uh, in reverse, when you put the engine into reverse. And as you can see, just like with the headlight on the front of the engine uh, on the pilot, uh, there is a little shade right here to simulate the... Um, the double headlight slash backup light that the real things did uh, have in real life. And you can see here's what it looks like when you uh, put the engine into reverse and when the backup light uh, turns on. Okay, so that's what the backup light looks like when, uh, uh, when it's activated. And then as you can see right here, there's a lot of uh, uh, legible printing on the side. Sorry, my mind kind of blanked out for just a second. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of legible printing and uh, 
uh, lettering right here on the back of the tender here. And then to top it all off, you do have this very nice, uh, this very um, uh, nicely done, uh, separately fitted ladder that goes up to the top of the tender. Something I forgot to mention before we uh, start this engine up and go on a bit of a, uh, a short running session, I should say, is that this bit of uh, pipework that connects the boiler to the first set of cylinders is articulated. It is hinged. So if I go ahead and run it over this curve right here, that's the wrong direction. Let's put it into forward. And I just slowly move it over the section of curve right here. You will see it does hinge like that. Which is a nice touch given the fact that uh, that was, I believe, something that was also on the real things. And that also gives you the opportunity to see some more of that pipe work right here, which is very, very... Uh, I do like that bit of piping right there. It's nice they fitted that in there. I'll give you a quick look at the other side of the engine uh, as well, just to give you a bit of a comparison here. It does look fairly similar, give or take a few minor changes. All right, it's time for the moment that everyone has been waiting for. Let's go ahead and fire her up and see how she sounds and runs. Channel Brakeman, NW12 is clean. We're showing any times on the rear train. Take out 20 for initial terminal brake test. Test the Roger. 25 reduction is given. Checking for leakage, over. Roger, showing 20 pounds. Walking the train. Breaking it out. So let's go ahead and take a listen to the whistle. Uh, as in the case with most Lionel engines these days, you've got a few different whistles to choose from. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go through them all. The first one is the one that I believe is the default one that is uh, the one that you get when you first put it on the layout. Time for number two. This one I think is my favorite. Here's the third whistle. Fourth one. And here's the last one. back to the first one. Now let's hear the different bells. So just like with the whistles, there are a few different bells to choose from. Let's take a listen. That's the first one. Here's the second one. Third one. fourth one and then here's the last one before we uh, circle back to the original as you can hear in the background the pop-off smoke is currently uh, uh, going off right now I don't know if you can see it too well or not. Yeah, you can get a decent look at it. As you can see, there it goes right there. Now let's listen to some crew talk. Uh, 
like this one is the sound of coal being shoveled into the firebox. Let's hear the uh, the water uh, the water fill up sound effect. My water tank's full. Oh. And then here is the sound of coal being loaded. the sound of the blowdown. With that all out of the way, let's go ahead and get her rolling. As you guys can all see, this is just an absolutely just incredible model. I honestly think that this is 
probably my favorite vision line engine Lionel has ever put out, and it is, in my opinion, probably one of the best O-scale engines I have ever laid my eyes on. It is just absolutely breathtaking. This gloss finish was one of the reasons I have literally was speechless when I first took this engine out of the box. As you can obviously tell, it looks great. It is just miraculously detailed. It sounds absolutely just immaculate. And uh, very glad that I was able to pick one of these up. And uh, I believe that a lot of the dealers still probably have a few of these in stock. So if you are interested in getting one of these, I highly recommend it. If you are, you know, if you do have, if it is within your budget, definitely would recommend it. Highly, highly recommend this engine. Definitely want to act fast though before they all sell out though. But yeah, it's great to have been able to get a hold of this engine. And it is just, uh, it's just, it's beautiful. It's an absolute masterpiece. Great work, Lionel. And uh, definitely looking forward to having this engine in my fleet. It's great to be back on YouTube. And like I said, uh, soon I'll be uploading a video kind of explaining my absence on where I've been. Uh, but yeah. That was the Class A, the long-awaited Vision Line Class A from Lionel. Thank you for watching the video. As always, I hope you like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. I'm glad to be back on YouTube, like I just said. And uh, hopefully I got some more content coming your way. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye, guys.